I now have the proud privilege of calling Professor Vaidyanathan. Professor Vaidyanathan is the Professor of Finance and Accounting at IIM Bangalore. He obtained his Fellow of Management Doctorate from IIM Calcutta. He has been a consultant to various organizations such as uh, Unilever's, Life Insurance Corporation, ITC, BPL, World Bank, Goldman Sachs, Sriram Group, Dalmia Group, Ministry of Finance, IDBI, the who's who. He authored a book called India Un Inc. about the unincorporated sector. He also published a book on pensions facing the future. Professor Vaidyanathan is the National Fellow of ICSSR in recognition of his contribution to social sciences. Uh, there is another aspect to him. He was part of the committee that researched the issue of black money and the eradication of black money economy in India. In 2011, <laughs> as far back as in 2011, uh, he, with his committee, recommended the abolition of high denomination currency notes. Now you know who to blame for all the cues <laughs> that are forming in India, Professor R. Vaidyanathan. Thank you, uh, Shushilji. Uh, I should really appreciate you because uh, two weeks before in Delhi, one enthusiastic uh, person who introduced me, he told uh, Professor Vaidyanathan has been involved with black money for the last 15 years. <laughs> so, uh, so this is a slightly better thing in terms of, you know, I told him don't uh, do any of those things because India is a very complicated country. I think all of you know, right? The accused to become judges, judges become accused and, you know, all type of thing. So suddenly they may arrest me that you are responsible for all the black money. Okay. Integrating Hindus, economy worldwide. I think uh, uh, Swamiji requires an uh, enormous amount of appreciation for taking this task. <laughs> He's very persistent, consistent, and you know, very conceptually clear. Around 2010, I think, he came to Bangalore and we had a lot of discussion. He went and met a lot of uh, business and industry people. You might be surprised, some of them suggested this uh, Hindu economic forum is not a good idea. You can have economic forum, you can have forum, you can have India, but why Hindu? But Swamiji smiled and left it at that. He didn't change or he didn't do, because he was very, very clear what he is uh, attempting and what he is aiming at. So that's something which is, uh, he came and told me, some of them told me that, if you only have, you know, Indian Economic Forum or Economic Forum or Forum or maybe nothing, we would be willing to be part of it, support it. And But Swamiji told, how can it be possible? The whole idea is to integrate the uh, Hindu. So I lightheartedly told him, when our constitution was being getting framed, one of the, some, some most of you may be knowing, uh, HUF is one of the legal organizations in India, Hindu undivided family. So there was a discussion actually. Kindly note, very interesting, it was not Hindu united family. Hindu undivided family. There is a subtle distinction. So the framers itself know that time that uh, calling it Hindu united family is not going to be very helpful. So let us keep it as undivided family. And over a long period of time, we have so many type of identities, divisions, and but now things are significantly changing. I would say we are in the uh, major cusp of a global change. This is a great opportunity for Hindus. Substantial amount of change is taking place in the uh, global economy. And uh, this is the time in which we should strive to leverage on it and in a sense assert ourselves on the global stage. First and foremost, G7 is on decline. G7, which used to have something like 55% of the 
share of the global GDP, today is uh, having something like 32 percent only. The remaining is uh, by others. The emerging markets, primarily India, China, and uh, Indonesia and Brazil, these four countries, which used to have something like 32 percent, now they have got 52 percent. Right? You can show that graph if it is available. Right? No, this is the thing. Very simple. Yeah. I'll use it. No problem. So, you can see there is a huge amount of decline in G7. And not only that, it is expected to become 25 percent in another five years. It's a very uh, major uh, change which has taken place. I remember somebody interviewing me and asking me, uh, when will the crisis get resolved? I told, crisis for whom? No, sir, there is a global crisis, you should know that. And we being globalized, we are also part of the crisis. So I told, we are not part of the crisis. Crisis is Anglo-Saxon crisis. So we are having different perspective. It will take 80 quarters to recover. And that girl was very brilliant, that business uh, TV channel. 80 mean 80 by 4. You mean 20 years it will take. I told, see, we are teachers. Even if a student gets 5 out of 100, we say there is a scope for improvement. We never say that you are useless and other thing. Very de and nowadays if you say useless, you may take me to Human Rights Commission and other thing. Uh, <laughs> professor is telling I am useless. And other. So, I told her it is not going to recover. Because there are some fundamental structural problems for all these countries. As uh, many of you will be knowing, 1820 the ascendancy of G7 took place because of industrial revolution and colonialism. Till 1820, India and China had 50% of the global GDP. Every century, first century, second, third, fourth. After 1820, it declined. Now it has started again moving up. That's why Angus Madison, who did an exhaustive study over a 20 year period, he mentioned that uh, countries, countries like India, are not emerging markets, they are re-emerging markets. It's very important. It looks terminological, but terminology is also equally important. He said Hindus are trying to retrieve where they were in the earlier part of the period. So there is a huge change which has uh, uh, taken place. And the structural change is because of enormous amount of borrowing done by the G7 countries. They are all indebted up to their neck. Phenomenally, they are indebted. You can see there. Where is this? Wait. Current global position is on purchasing power parity basis, China, USA, India and Japan. That is the current situation. Obviously, these four are going to play a very major role in terms of uh, you know, what one can call the musical dance in the next 10 years. As is my Agi correctly mentioned, among the three C's, one of the major C's is China. And uh, why they have come, this is the thing. The overall debt is phenomenal in G7 countries. Some of them this, have crossed 200, 300 percent and other thing. Our own Britain, for instance, is 500 percent today. 550 percent of its GDP is in debt. Our own Britain I call because I tell my students, one of these days they may ask us to take over and run the country. Hindus will be asked, you kindly help us to run the country. We ran your country for some 200 years, so you also do some help to us. So that's in bad shape. All of them are in bad shape. Among the debt, <coughs> sovereign debt is no issue because you can always print note what is called government debt. Corporate debt, most of the time it falls on the government. The third is what is called the household debt. And uh, that is really a major problem for most of these countries. How household debt has phenomenally increased? A six-letter word called saving has been removed from the dictionary of 
most of the G7 countries. They have, that page has been torn. There is nothing called saving. Household saving is 1%, half a percent, or because it is consume and live. Why household saving has significantly fallen? Another six letter word called family has also declined. There is a phenomenal amount of decline in the family in all these G7 countries. If you see household saving rate, we are far, far ahead in terms of 25, 26 and other things. Most of the others are 1, 2, 3, 4 like that. The, oh God, something is. The family as an enterprise or family as a unit of, is gone. As the Archbishop of England nicely put, the sovereignty of the family is no more there. Family doesn't. So it was a joint family, then it became a nuclear family, then proton family, one parent family. And mostly it is one mother family. Maybe soon neutron families in terms of children without families. 50% last year of births were outside wedding, outside marriage. When I was a student, unfortunately they were called bastards. But now the New York Times say this is the new normal. I always have enormous amount of appreciation for Americans. Their ability to coin words in order to explain complicated issues. It's called new normal. Not only that, you kindly see 10 to 19 years, 7% of the births are taking place. They are children, they are not married, having children. It's a huge crisis facing the G7 world. Substantial problem associated with the destruction of families. And large businesses initially wanted a small families, obviously. If you see the advertisement in the 70s and 80s, it will always be a happy family mean husband, wife and son and daughter. Sometime a dog also. Happy family will never have mother-in-law, father-in-law, sisters-in-law, no way, aunties, no. Only four members and they can be accommodated in a car also. So the businesses encourage the small families because they will sell more, more products. When I was a child, we used to live in a 14-member house with two soap bars. One soap bar for women, another for men. But if there were seven households, obviously the number of soap bars will be more, number of refrigerators will be more, number of television will be more, more houses, more. But every such idea has got in its own womb the problem of its own seeds of destruction. So the family has shrank to that extent. Now the corporates are finding it very tough. They have to reinvigorate, they have to innovate new families. Post-1960, contraceptive revolution, post-contraceptive civilization they call it. You have sex without children. But today, Japan and US are frantically trying to find out mechanism by which you have children without sex. Stem cell research, various types of, because the demography is challenging them. Most of the countries, Northern Europe and uh, Middle Europe, you have reproductive rate less than 1.5, 1.2, like that. So there is a massive crisis, which of course you have the youth unemployment rate, youth in West is 16 to 24. And like India, you know, in India, 45, 46, all are youth. 60 also is youth. So there is a uh, difference there. You can see the massive unemployment rate which is facing the Europe. Population is, Europe used to have 25% of the global population in First World War. <coughs> Today they have 8% and they are expected to become 2%. Europe is practically disappearing. <coughs> There is a huge, huge opportunities for global Hindus to look at this. Second is not to imitate the same thing. If you go by the same path, we are not going to be any different or any change. You can see here, this is the one which is going to replenish the declining population in Europe. You know the consequences of this already. Every day 10,000 people are trying to enter. And uh, I can tell you, Europe is sitting on a tinder box, maybe three to five years time. 
not more than that. Can you remember last 2000 years, every conflict in the world originated from Europe, not from Asia, not from Africa, not from other parts of the world. So this is going to be the major challenge or thrust areas. They thought this will help in terms of replenishing the labor force. They could have as well had people from countries like India, where they are more law abiding and more work conscious. But uh, unfortunately, this is the one which is uh, getting replenished. So what is the West failed because of these? They nationalized the families, privatized the business. Nationalized families mean all rights were given up. Duties were given up, rights are only, sorry, rights are only kept. There are no more duties. Children have to be taken care of by the government. Old people will be taken care of by the government. Single mothers have to be taken care of by the government. So the whole thing is duty-less society. That's the beauty of the society. That's why in every mall you go, you have a huge board in airports and other duty-free. That is where you first see you are duty-free. There is no duty. There are no, that four letter word has been abolished. There are only rights. This is something very, very major challenge to the Hindu diaspora. We have to be very cautious that uh, a society without any duties is not going to have a long term survival. Relationship based, entire thing, it was converted into rule based and uh, contract based. And uh, they also agree multiculturalism has failed. And that is the greatest strength of Hindus all over the world. Our ability to have different type of uh, what you may loosely call the salad and survive. We are not... Uh, the fundamental reason for Hindus are we are an accepting society. We are not tolerating society. Tolerance automatically implies it can be intolerant sometime. But we accept. We don't and we absorb actually over period of time our uh, uh, system how the opportunity for creating new businesses and we will have a large session regarding as it was mentioned about market access as well as uh, financial and a global banking network we will see that later and we have to expand the markets and all these areas are the future areas where individual sessions is going to focus on many of these uh, issues and other things. Most important is we have uh, appreciation for Indira uh, Krishna, sorry, Indira Nui. She was earlier Indira Krishna Murthy. We have appreciation for Pichai, we have appreciation for Nadala. All these are great people, they have achieved great, but they are all still employees, let us remember. So the Integrating Hindu economy required today ownership of global banks. This is what I have been telling from 2006, 2007, 2008 meltdown, we could have acquired some major banks. We should own HSBC, we should own something like Citibank, we should own something like uh, DNB. Some of them are in major crisis, so you can easily, so this is one of the major tasks. Second is global network. We must have equivalent of CNN and BBC owned by Hindus, which project the dharmic soft power in its own way. Everybody knows CNN projects its own uh, way of uh, what, what is loosely called left liberal and BBC. So we require to have another network. Third is we must, Hindus, in order to have integrating economic power, must create universities like MIT, like Stanford, owned by them, maybe. And uh, these universities should be in a position to produce a continuous stream of youngsters, which is uh, providing significant amount of inputs, as well as act as think tank. So global presence in the form of uh, banks, financial institution, in the form of uh, network, in the sense uh, television and uh, news network and uh, global presence in the form of universities. Nearly, approximately one can say thousand temples are there in US created by Hindus. Each one at one million, something like one billion we would have invested. 
half of that investment we can create real major global universities which are also considered as temples of learning these are the three areas i think uh, we should think in terms of uniting we can leverage on the such crisis of course there are conflicts within abrahamic civilization they are fighting with each other what are called rol and rop religion of love and religion of peace every day is killing people alternatively and uh, between them and other dharmic civilization there is a fight going on and modernism versus traditional values and systems so these are the because europe has completely given up christianity europe has become agnostic or what you may loosely call atheistic so there is a huge us substantial portion but still a large chunk of us is what you call church going and bible believing and other thing. so but our business based on sustainable model a kindly note feminine we are primarily in terms of feminine in our approach toward things because uh, it is not only creating it is sustaining and uh, eco friendly and all over india you will find hindu women are more eco friendly actually you will find early morning they go around and watering some unknown plants they are the ability to find which plants are having which characteristics and they are extremely friendly towards animals women actually provide the core strength of eco friendliness in our context in india whether it is tribal women whether it is uh, women in the urban areas they are always more conscious about eco friendliness when my grandmother used to say this plastic and other thing are dangerous everybody used to laugh at her you are not modern enough for another thing become modern ma what is this you are still clinging to your jute bag and today the same jute bag my granddaughter is carrying telling that this is the uh, you know what one can call fashion statement plastic we will not so my grandmother i would say is very very far sighted more eco friendly understood the nature of the issues and the family and community oriented we are and ours are relationship based we are not uh, strictly in terms of only the uh, contracts and rules much more in terms of like uh, our friend bajanka nicely told and uh, agarwal ji mentioned are we in a position to have our links with the community ability to call them for dinner ability to provide for them and uh, substantial amount uh, is being done in the country except not much advertisement is made ram krishna ashram provides uh, something like uh, 60 to 65000 uh, medical dispensaries hospitals large number of temples provide uh, uh, food in the afternoon ekal vidyalaya conducts uh, thousands and thousands of schools so so much of uh, uh, community oriented activities are taking place among the hindus and that is one of the major strength of our economy at least we have to create a global pressure group our ability to uh, you know talk about our requirement and stand up and say and there is a huge change also which has come about you know about uh, hindus all over the world i remember in the 70s as a student when i came here and uh, they were all the passport visa checking you know they were wondering why this man from a you know country of snake charmers and you know coming and it's all right he is coming sir he has got some uh, admission in some okay but today it is totally different i can see the worry on his face he ask he wants to know whether i am it related man he is going to i am going to come and set up some more shops here so there is a huge churning or huge change has taken place in terms of how the hindus are looked at so that is the our world view is cyclical animal and plant friendly globally and uh, community and family are building blocks we are relationship based we are not 100% contract based and uh, unfortunately family is not at fully nationalized in india given the size it is very difficult to do that also in terms of and future belongs to sanatan dharma one can be very very confident of it there is absolutely no doubt because uh, 
see we used to have conflict we used to have you know differences i am sure many of you will recall when adi shankara went and had a debate about advaita with mandan mishra right it was a major debate mandan mishra's wife herself was the judge actually she sat there adi shankara accepted it even though she was the wife of mandan mishra he never suspected that she is going to be partial or anything and then uh, the debate went on for days and finally based on you know who's uh, this tulsi garland uh, becomes uh, withered away first because he is the one who gets anger the point i want to mention is debate is one of the sustaining qualities of hindu dharma adi shankara could have gone with a belt bomb and sorted out the whole issue within you know 5 minutes there is mandan mishra and then you know burst and then he would have become martyr and that fellow would have become a but it never happened actually 180 years believe me sir there is a case going on 180 years between two groups of what are called this vaishnavites in tamil nadu how a temple elephant should be had the namam or what is called the symbol whether it should be sharp down or it should be few 180 years but none of them attacked others none of them it went on and on a lot of de- debates are going on and agama shastras and various other so ours is completely in terms of discussion and debate and that is our major strength and that is how we can integrate on a global basis so we believe in cyclical nature it's not linear of course some people will criticize and this is the only thing which gives you also certain amount of cynicism if my court case is not settled at least next birth it will be i will become a judge judge will become the accused and accused will become the defense lawyer so somehow it will be sorted out that idea attitude but that's not the important thing important thing is our ability to conceptualize heterogeneity is the essence of our civilization we are not uh, but there is a important point we call in terms of unity in diversity but many a time what diversity is only stressed last 60 70 years that's one of the unfortunate things of the neruvian thinking diversity is alone stressed that's not correct unity also should be stressed so in the process what happened uh, there are i am i was told some three telugu associations and one federation four tamil associations six gujarati i'm sure bengali will be much more in us so because diversity is if there are five bengalis everybody knows seven associations will get formed so diversity is not the core aspect of our civilization for hindus it is unity and uh, unity we have diversity we don't we accept it so but stressing exclusively diversity part is not going to be of much benefit to the hindus and uh, in a way living with social norms based upon dharmic society that is what we are talking in terms of earn in 100 different ways given 1000 different ways most important to remember is among hindus the highly regarded are those who gave up not those who acquired you don't appreciate a person because he acquired he built a 29 uh, story building or he built a good he was rich another but uh, those who are appreciated are those who gave up actually in terms of giving up for others giving up for community giving up for society starting with buddha and uh, recent example of gandhi and so many people who have not had anything for themselves we had leaders like kamaraj who gave up for others nobody could say that they acquired huge amount of wealth or something so giving away mahabharat karna is the greatest remembered character by everybody even though he was a not a legitimate child and he had his own uh, limits of suffering but still his name has been etched because of his ability to give he gave so much throughout his life so whoever gives get the appreciation in hindu dharma not just acquisition so if you want to integrate on a global basis we must remember about our ethos or our wealth and shung of giving to others sharing with others so this is what is the basic dharmic society 
So this is uh, where we will go now. Question one, global opportunities. Our friend uh, Nachiketa, I am sure, is here somewhere. He will be facilitating the process. So thank you for your patient hearing. And uh, thank you to Shushilji for coordinating this. Thanks a lot.